Um, thank you, first of all, for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, we appreciate it very much. And um, a shout out as well to anyone who may be joining us live um, on our Google Plus Hangout. Uh, for those of you in the audience who may not be aware, uh, Mayo Clinic Center for Social Media has embraced a lot of technology in the last um, couple of years. We have our own Facebook page, um, a YouTube channel, Twitter channel, multiple, uh, Spanish and English, and we recently um, joined the Google Plus and launched a hangout this evening. Uh, we are streaming our presentation live, so um, thank you as well for you folks joining us online. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things to get us started. Uh, for those of us here in the audience, please help yourself to food and drink. Uh, restrooms are out the door and on your left. Um, everyone uh, in the audience should also have an evaluation form. If you do not, um, if you could raise your hand, we do have forms for you. And if you all bear with me for a second while I get those back out. We hope that you'll take the opportunity to fill out the evaluations um, after the presentation. Uh, for those folks that are, are participating online, we welcome you to leave your comments during or after the presentation as well on the Google Plus um, Hangout page. Um, we're going to do things just a little bit differently because of the Google Plus tonight. Um, I passed out some index cards. If you do need some more, we will be walking around. There's also some on the table just outside the door. Um, if you have questions, please jot them down. Either myself or one of my colleagues will be um, collecting them during the presentation, and we'll go ahead and do a Q&A at the end. Uh, we're going to alternate as best as we can, questions from the audience and questions online while we have our experts here in the room. Uh, the physicians will also be here afterwards to answer some additional questions. Um, our goal is to try to keep to time as much as we can and get you all out of here at a very reasonable hour of 8.30. So, um, with that, I have one question for one of our physicians before we get started. Dr. Barthera, could you please pick a number for me between 1 and 60? 25. Would everyone look at the top right-hand corner of their evaluation? And who is lucky number 25? Hey. I have a prize for you. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Juan Guadera to the stage. Good evening, and thank you, thank you very much for coming. It's so nice to see this audience at this hour. I recognize a few faces, a few patients that I've seen. I'm glad that you're here, which tells a lot. At least you're alive and coming, so it's a good thing. I'm impressed to be here today. Uh, last time I was in this meeting, uh, in this room, the CEO was here. So I can't believe I'm, st I'm standing in the same place that he was. So it's quite a challenge. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the topic. We're going to talk a little bit of sinus analogy. And just to let you know what we have. The Mayo Clinic Sinus Center is, a, is an idea that started about a year and a half, two years ago. What we did is we put together an ENT surgeon, Dr. Bolger, who you'll be seeing soon, uh, a surgeon and a friend who is an outstanding surgeon with more than 20 years of experience in ENT and his special training in rhinology. And with myself, who I've been an allergist at Mayo Clinic for 20 years, my area of interest has been nose and sinuses and the complications and the causes of nose and sinus diseases. Uh, so we put together this team trying to provide the best care we can in one place. You know what happens many times in the community. You go from one office to the other to the other office, and you're going back and forward. This way, what we think is we put it together in one center so we can provide service in the same place. We always have the background of Mayo Clinic. And we're very lucky we have one of our allergists here who was visiting. So the allergy department also support us. 
the pulmonary department, the laboratory medicine, the Mayo Clinic model of care. So we have a comprehensive system. Well, let me move forward and talk a little bit about the issues. It's, it's fascinating, sinus disease and allergy disorders are very common, and there's a lot of misconception. In part, it's because a lot of the treatments you can buy them over the counter, you don't need to, to have prescriptions for a lot of things. So let me give you some misconceptions. My sinuses are killing. Well, seldom the sinuses kill. There's a few rare diseases, and it's interesting, seldom the, uh, the sinuses produce life-threatening disease, but it's quite a problem, as we all know, produces a lot of discomfort. Well, my allergies are giving me this headache. There's a dictum in allergy. Allergies don't hurt. People with allergic rhinitis, with itchy nose, runny nose, seldom if ever have headaches. So just to let you know a little misconception there. My seasonal, my symptoms are seasonal. I'm sure that is an allergy. Well, also seasonal larviral infections. And you don't know how many patients we see that say it has to be an allergy. And it was that they got a cold in the spring and they had a cold in the fall. And then they had an infection afterward. So it's, the fact that it's seasonal not always means that it's related to that. Since my friend has sinus surgery and didn't work, I shouldn't have surgery. It's a good common question. In part, this is a misconception because Many people think about sinus disease as one disease. And what I'm going to try to show you is that sinuses, there's different diseases of the sinuses. And they have different entities, they have different causes, and they have different treatments. So not because your friend had bad luck means that you're going to have bad luck. Uh, my doctor is prescribing steroids medicine. That's crazy. Well, we use a lot of nasal steroids. They're safe as they can be if you use them appropriately. Sometimes we need to use oral steroids, but we try to avoid that, but sometimes it's not necessary. All right, so what are my goals? My goals are, number one, to define what is allergy. What the word allergy means when you come to see the doctor, contrary to what you talk all around. What we want to define the word sinus and what would that mean, and the treatments for this condition. When a doctor doesn't know the cause of a disease, I always have a bright idea. It's so simple to find a cause. Oh, it has to be an allergy. And if I cannot prove it's an allergy, I usually blame it to a virus, and if that fails, must be your nerves. Very common excuses that we use. Fortunately, allergies, we can prove it in or out. We can do allergy testing and prove that allergy really is the cause or not. About viruses and nerves, that's a little harder. So I still use that excuse every so often. Well, what is an allergy? An allergy actually is a atypical response to the environment. The proper word is atopic. It's an overreaction of the body to an environmental exposure. And it's a disease that it doesn't affect only the nose. It's a disease that affects the eyes, conjunctivitis, the nose, rhinitis, the chest, asthma, the skin, eczema. It's part of the same systemic disease of the immune response against the environmental exposure. What is a rhinitis? A rhinitis is just an inflamed nose. And there's definitely many causes of rhinitis a viral, allergic, bacterial, and there's some immunological diseases that can produce just the congested, stuffy nose. So that is the rhinitis. And the sinusitis means just inflammation of the sinuses. And again, there's different causes that can produce problems in the sinuses. And I'll show you a little bit of that. Anatomy, problems of anatomy, problems of function, sometimes problems of development. The more I work in this area, the more I find developmental errors that happened many years ago, and now they're starting to give you problems. And also immune disorders. Well, what is the best treatment for nose and sinus diseases? The best treatment is a good diagnosis. 
because then you can poke the surface. And believe it or not, even though we think we know a lot about this disease, there's a lot of things that we do not know. But having an accurate diagnosis is the best way to find a good treatment. This is a simplistic way to divide the mechanisms of nose and sinus disease. We put it in this triangle and we say, okay, what is your anatomical problems of your nose? Two, is there an infectious disorder of the nose or in sinuses or is there mucosal disease? Is the lining that is the problem and is producing an abnormal response? So what are causes for anatomy? Common causes are septal deformity, drainage issues out of the sinuses, nasal polyps, rarely fortunately tumors, and when I worked in pediatrics, once in a while I find a pea or a corn or something <laughs> in the nose. So it's something. Mucosal diseases, we divide them in two kinds. Allergic diseases that we divide them in seasonal or perennial. Here in Florida, believe it or not, the only season, truly fall and season we have is February to April. And it's usually tree pollen. The rest of the year, the concentration of pollen is not as high as it used to be when you were up north. Or when I used to live in Pittsburgh and Cleveland, it was a lot more pollen there. But um, there's other diseases that look just like allergies, but they're not allergic. And there's a strange one called NARES. It's a condition that it looks identical to allergy, but we cannot find the allergen that produces it. And a bunch of other disorders that to some degree we're going to review. Infections, by far colds, viral infections, is what keeps everybody busy and frequently complicated with bacterial infections. Um, acute sinusitis and chronic sinusitis these are different things, are different disorders, and we'll talk a little bit. Granulomatous infections, fortunately we don't see in this country very much, and other disorders, of course. Uh, fungal disease, allergic fungal sinusitis, are other disorders that we see also. So what we do to evaluate this? The best and more important thing is taking a good look. It's taking the time to ask questions and to answer uh, and to understand the symptoms and do a good physical exam. We do a lot of nasal endoscopy, and I'll show you a little bit. Dr. Bolger is going to show you a lot more. We do allergy testing. We do CT scans of the sinuses, and we do some immune testing because some immune disorders also can produce these problems. And this is just a very fast review of the structures of the nose in a way that hopefully you understand it. Uh, the septum is here, in this and as you can see, there's a lot of, but the lining also is covered with cilia that is directing the mucus to the normal openings of the sinus. And so sometimes obstruction can be a cause of infection. And is by far the most common cause of current sinusitis. A patient who catches the cold, the cold lasts days and goes away in most of the people. But a few fluid build in. And then all of a sudden, bacteria settle in there, and then you have an infection. So it's a combination of viral infections and anatomical drainage, what makes the patient come and come with more and more infection. Then the other part is the immune system. And I tried to simplify it a little bit here. It's, it's very complex, and I don't know if I understand it totally. But in this example, I'm giving you ragweed, for example. And the cells that act in the immune system, and you will see that sometimes they activate this protein, IgE. And you will see frequently that we order a test called total IgE or specific IgE. So you will see that frequently in the test that we do. Uh, the lining also responds 
with the stimuli to some degree because of activation of these IgEs, and your lymphocyte system is what produces the IgE. When this IgE binds to these cells, the mast cells, it releases all these chemicals. One of them is histamine, and histamine produces itching, sneezing, runny nose. It produces coughing and wheezing. It produces eczema, too. So that's why all the disorders are somewhat related. And that's why we use antihistamines to control this response. Well, this is part of the evaluation. As you can see, that picture is old. I had some dark hair one time in my life. That was the flexible scope and the rigid scope. And Dr. Bolger is the master on these. And so he'll show you more about that. And what we do with those scopes is we try to reach these places that are a little way within the nose. You see, most of the time, we think that the nose is just this part of the, uh, this part. But actually, the nose goes into your head quite a bit. It's about two-thirds of the space is we can uh, reach with a normal exam. So with the scopes, we're trying to go all the way there to see where it drains and have a better idea. The only problem is that if you go through the wrong hole, come out on the wrong hole, then you're in trouble. And this is what we see. Suppose this is a patient typical with allergies. The lining is swollen, it's pale, it's edematous. And then you see combination of factors. This patient has a deviated septum in a very allergic lining. So sometimes you have a combination of two factors in the same place. Or you see patients like this that thought for years they had allergies. Actually, what has is a polyp. It looks like a little grape in the middle of that that is obstructing the sinuses so the sinuses is not draining well. And once in a while, we see this disease, which is very difficult, it's called Wegner's, where the lining is raw, it bleeds, it's infected, it starts. Well, this is allergy testing. And we do something prick testing in the back, and in, in occasionally we do intradermal testing in the eye. This is obviously an extreme. This is a patient that was overwhelming. That's why I took the picture. And when we do the test, we give you a report that looks like this. And it's what are the allergens that we test you and the kind of response you have. And in this case, the patient uh, was allergic primarily to house dust mites. And that was the only time. All right, so that's more or less the kind of test you will see. Well, how important is this issue of the dust mite? By far, dust mite is the most common allergen in this part of the country. Why? Heat and humidity is a big problem, and that's where mites do best. How important it is? I'm going to give you just as an analogy a, a few asthma studies. This is a study of asthma that showed that patients Patients who were exposed to a higher concentration of dust mites early on in life had a higher probability of developing asthma. So allergen exposure with time was a significant risk factor for that. How about molds? Molds is a good, floor is a good place for molds. How bothersome it can be. Again, another study about mold, mold and severe asthma. This study actually was done in Mayo Clinic Rochester. And what they saw is that there are a few uh, children were having severe asthma attacks only on those months. Because it's the season where alternaria, this mold that is in the leaves, is in the crops, is outside, is what's giving you trouble. Or cockroaches. Uh, I didn't put a picture of cockroaches. I know that we're having dinner. But this is, this is a study on many places in the country where they saw Patient, people who live in areas that had a lot of concentration of cockroaches and they were allergic, and these patients required a hospital more, they were wheezing more, they went to the doctor more often. So cockroach allergy is a very significant problem. It's fascinating, in the 20 years that I've been in, in Jacksonville, I think we're seeing a mutation in the amount of cockroaches in living homes. And I don't know if you've seen that, but the con when I moved here, there was only palmetto bugs. Now you see the little roaches all over the place, and they're all over. So the second part of the evaluation is the, the anatomy. 
And the best way to look at this anatomy, you remember this image, is by doing a CT scan at a time. And actually, a CT scan is a very simple way of looking at things. Uh, again, just to give you a little bit of uh, re uh, revise the anatomy, in this case, you see the septum, you see the turbinate, you see the little bone there, you have the turbinate here, and that patient has a polyp there that was producing an effect. The sinuses give us a lot of information. And I, I, I give you a fast course in CT scan reading because it's very easy. As you can see, bone is white, black is there, and gray is soft tissue. And we cut you from the front and go all the way to the back. And you will see how many things you start seeing. There are the eyes and the sinuses between your eyes. And as you can see, they look nice and clear, the septum and the turbinate. You go a little further back, on the back part of the eyes, and you see the opening of the sinuses already. You probably are ex experts already looking at this anatomy, how the sinuses drain. And look, that patient already has surgery. That opening is, is much, much wider. Despite that, that patient has a sinus infection in this side and doesn't have it in that side. I wonder why. So we keep on going further up back, and we see the opening is wide open. Despite that, it has a sinus infection there. I wonder why. Look at that. That's a tube abscess. So you see, the, the CT scan was able to tell us that the sinus problem was a tube. And by fixing the tube, the sinus was healed. So it's easy, to, as you can see, it's easy to see. As, as you see there, uh, the CT scan changes with time and with the clinical presentation. For example, this is. This is a patient who had rip rowing sinusitis, and you see that the sinuses are totally gray except for a little bit of black in the top. And here it looks like a little cup full of mucus. Or you have patients that produce polyps, and you see they're hanging up from the top. There's a little bit of fluid in the bottom, but it's kind of hanging from up there. Once in a while, you see a patient like that. Fortunately, not very often, because this happened on a Friday afternoon. And this patient said, doctor, I want some prednisone. I cannot breathe through my neck. That's it. So let's see. Let's get a CT scan of the sinuses and the radiology code. Now that you can read it. You see, everything is gray. This should be black. You keep on going to the frontals. That should be black. Whoa, what's going on here? The bone is gone. And the polyp is going into the brain and into the eye. And the guy was complaining about stuffy nose. And he was not complaining of headaches. <laughs> it's interesting. Once in a while, we see also this, a patient who had headache and sinus disease. And he goes to surgery and continues with headaches. Second surgery, third surgery, fourth surgery, and the headaches continue. Why the headaches continue? Because the patient has migraine. And now the nose is all destroyed. It has no structures there. And the lining is totally done. So that's why a good diagnosis helps you better than many other things. Two words about the immune system. The immune system does only two things in your body. Essentially protects you from the outside. And secondly, it scans your system to look at cells that have been damaged so they don't become into cancer. And we have all these organized systems that help us to do that job. Organs and glands and this nerve. So when we try to test your immune system, we check just the blood count, regular CBC, and then we do some immunoglobulin testing. IgE is the allergy antibody. IgA is the antibody that protects us at the level of the line, the nose, the eye, the chest, the GI tract. The IgM is your first antibody when the immune system is reacting systemically. The IgG is the second immune response. That's why you frequently get a test and they tell you you had an old infection. It's because the IgG is high, but the IgE is low. All right? So that's the way we use it. And then we decide about the treatment. And the treatment could be medical. And we do as much as possible to treat you medically if that is what you need, or surgically at times. But it's so good to work in a team because we frequently need both and we work together 
to try to improve your care by doing both. One thing we want to be sure is not to overtreat, not to overtreat the cold. Many, many patients are running to the antibiotic in the first week of a cold. And then what happens is you're overusing antibiotics. And then down the road, they don't work. So, and we know that a lot of the patients that get a sinus infection, these are the bacteria that we get. So frequently we treat them. Dr. Bolger will show you that we do a special way of culturing to try to see specifically what to grow there. And then we decide when you need an antibiotic. This, in general, is a good way to define when you need an antibiotic. If you have symptoms that linger more than 10 days, if your symptoms are bad and are consistent, you have yellow drainage through the day, or if you catch a second wave, we call it. The first wave is your cold. As you're getting better, the cold comes back. It's not a cold. It's a bacterial infection. Then we need to treat it with antibiotics. And we use different uh, recommendations of treatment that comes from different societies and depending on the different risk factors, and we choose different drugs depending on those. And there's second line treatments that they also depend on the severity of disease. Uh, we need to individualize therapy. We do a lot of things that probably uh, you can use at home and it can get you better. For example, the nasal decongestants, they're all afferent. I used to be very afraid of it. I'm not anymore. I think it's a great medicine to use it directly in the nose, but use it sparingly. If you use it less than two or three times a week, you're not going to get addicted. I don't like the oral decongestants because you can rebound to them too. And a lot of the patients here have hypertension, have tachycardia, have difficulty sleeping. Why put a medicine in your body? that's going to work in the nose, if you can put it straight up in the nose, it makes no sense. Nasal saline washes, we use a lot of that, and it makes a world of a difference. Uh, nasal steroids, I already talked about it, and occasionally we use oral steroids. How long to treat? That is a very difficult question that has not, never been answered. An old doctor, or a doctor who was old when she gave this article, uh, recommended treat it until your infection is improved plus seven days. It's just a general rule that I personally use that I learned from there. To conclude, we talked a lot about nasal sinus infection. Different disorders, different approach, a good diagnosis gives you better results. Uh, the best, a good diagnosis is the best for, way. In a team approach, is the best way to do it because we work in different areas. And always using in this system the male model of care when I have support from other services and other departments. This is our team. Uh, Judy Morris that is here. Kathy, uh, Kathy Murray that is here. All the people are not here today, but it's a great team. And again, we have the male system that backs it up. Well, we truly hope uh, we can help you and thank you for your attention. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming tonight and for your attention. My goal here is to just give a brief general overview about surgery, sort of an introduction. So I hope this meets your ex expectations. <clears throat> so our, our approach here I'd like to outline uh, at first, and this is kind of continuing on. It'll be sort of the surgical aspect of the approach. Um, First, I try to make a dedicated effort to understand what's going on in each patient. Next, I try to understand the specific symptoms that the patient has. 
each patient sort of comes with their own complex of symptoms and really try to listen to that. I'd like to go back and consider the response that the patient has had or lack of response to the medical therapy. Evaluate the test results the patient brings with them that they've had going through the medical side of things. And then decide about conducting some additional testing. And then I strongly consider repeating what I'll term comprehensive or aggressive medical therapy. So the sum total of this is really an effort to try to avoid surgery. So sometimes just giving it one more last effort that's a full court press can be the difference between needing surgery and not needing surgery. Diagnostic tests that we would use, Dr. Guderis has outlined the allergy test and has gotten into the CAT scan, so I'll focus just a little bit more on the sinonasal endoscopy. The endoscope is a system of lenses and prisms uh, in this rod system here that is a very high-powered uh, light source. It's attached to it, a halogen light source, and it gives excellent illumination and magnification. So you get a phenomenal examination of the intranasal structures with this. This video is the endoscope going into the patient's right nostril. This is the middle turbinate. To the right side of this, you can see the opening into the maxillary sinus. There's no tumor, there's no infection. It's nice and pink, it's open. You're gonna see us move the turbinate just very gently and slide the scope by. We'll be able to see into the next sinus up called the ethmoid sinus where a very high percentage of the disease starts. So you can get a very, very powerful view there. In contrast to that, we're gonna look at a patient that uh, the findings are quite different. Very narrow space to navigate through, a lot of swelling. You don't see the openness, and you can see pus filling the area there. Okay, and it's coming out of the ethmoid sinus and it filling the nose there. So with the endoscope, it really improves our diagnosis by getting up there and looking. It allows us to see if there's infection. If that infection is there, I can take a small catheter and collect that sterilely and send that off to the microbiology lab. And we can then process that and find the first day usually what the bacteria is. And then the second or third day, the lab actually will test a series of maybe 10 antibiotics against the bacteria. And by the second or third day, we often know what bacteria it is and which antibiotics work. And very often that, when we go back and look and see which antibiotics were tried beforehand, we'll find out that the bacteria is resistant. So like Dr. Guadera showed the slide, where we know pretty much for acute sinusitis what 90% of the patients, the bacteria, the two or three bacteria they have, and the family practice doctors usually accurately give medicines and it works 90% of the time, but occasionally it doesn't. And then increasingly we're finding that antibiotics maybe have been overused and there's drug resistance. So that's where just collecting the specimen and then trying a, a culture-directed antibiotic can sometimes be the difference for a patient. Um, this endoscopy also gives a great view if there's polyps or a tumor present, as Dr. Guderis has showed. Just a little bit on the CAT scan. If I can find the cursor here. Where is, there it is. So Dr. Guderis showed you the normal CAT scan. On the left here, it's black. It's air, air. You can see the black is all air inside the sinuses. On the right-hand side, we can see the gray area where we had the sinus infection. So that's very, very clear with the CAT scan. It's not just infection, though. So many patients will come and they'll say they have their sinuses are filling them, they're having a lot of sinus problems, a lot of sinus infection, they can't breathe through their nose, and they think it's their sinuses. This is a, an example of a patient that came like this, and we can see that the sinuses are all black, so they're clear, they're not gray. But we can see the nasal structures here on this side is very congested. Over here, you can see a straight septum, turbinates, and a lot of black around the septum. That's air that they can breathe clearly through. And on this side, it's a curved septum. It's really gnarly. The structures are all touching each other. So that's what was giving the patient the sensation of nasal congestion. 
They couldn't breathe through their nose. And then you can imagine if that person got a cold, how um, little air they'd be able to breathe through their nose and how difficult that would be for them. So again, the CAT scan can help us to, to make a distinction that's very basic. Is this nose or is this sinus? And then the surgery has to be directed to the right place there. And this patient here, there's some very sort of simple outpatient surgeries that can be highly effective for that patient. All right, again, the CT scan is very important for response to therapy. Here's a patient with sinusitis. We give medical treatment, like one last ditch effort. And here we have the patient come back. So the CAT scan is very, very effective tool as a follow-up for uh, treatment also. So that's kind of our approach, just in a nutshell. And I'm just going to give a couple cases to illustrate this first step to the approach. So this case, we had a 45-year-old female who came to see us. And she had headaches. She had a history of allergy and asthma. She also had symptoms of nasal congestion. And she had received multiple courses of antibiotics without any relief. She had surgery recommended at an outside institution. And she sought us out just for a second opinion before surgery. So our evaluation revealed um, that she had a sinus uh, opacification in the sphenoid sinus. This is kind of in the center of the skull, back of the nose and between the ears. And it's a sinus that's really correlated with a lot of headaches. So uh, it's very reasonable that she had her headaches and it's reasonable that they were talking about doing surgery. Um, one of the things that I thought about in this patient was um, could something else be going on? Was this just blockage? of the sinus, like a plumbing problem that I had to open to drain, or an anatomic problem, or could this be something else? She had a history of uh, allergies and asthma. So we just heard from Dr. Guderes how these are kinds of inflammation that's in the body. So I drew a blood level of uh, a test called IgE that looks for inflammation that's kind of of an allergic type of nature. And this came back at 5,400, and typical one is about 100 or 150. So this is ma orders of magnitude higher. And based on that, I gave her the option of surgery or just repeating the medical therapy, and that's kind of what I had was trying to advocate for, and she was very happy to go along with that. And so we, re we repeated medical therapy, but we took a little different approach, not just to treat infection with antibiotics, but to try to treat inflammation. And we used medicine called methylprednisolone, which is an oral steroid. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce a term here. I'm saying aggressive medical therapy. I'm really taking like this extra step to try to, to um, get this to uh, address this inflammation. So we tried this. And um, after our treatment, in one month, she came back. Her sinus was cleared. And you can see the IgE level has dropped to 32. So the symptoms of her headaches resolved, the CT scan totally cleared, and we avoided surgery. Okay. And I introduced this term, aggressive medical therapy. I sort of used the term earlier of comprehensive medical therapy. And the specific adjective that you use here is not really that important. You could say thoughtful. You could say extra. You could say, in addition to antibiotics, decongestant or nasal spray. Classically, a lot of ENT doctors don't like to use oral steroids. There can be some complications with them, and they sort of fear those complications. Then uh, steroids are mostly used by medical doctors for conditions that are much more severe than sinusitis. And so if that complication was to occur in a setting of lupus, it would be one thing. But in sinusitis, they're, they're um, a little bit fearful about using them. But I, I think in situations like this, um, you are able to, um, these are the, uh, the, the few cases where Dr. Guderes was talking about selected cases where using steroids are really beneficial. So we have risk versus benefit, and I think this is clear the, the benefit here. Uh, case number two is uh, a patient that had frontal headaches in this area, and you can see by the CAT scan the, um, the opacification, the gray, instead of the black in the frontal sinus. Um, it had multiple courses of antibiotics. Again, no relief. Uh, surgery was recommended at another institution. Came to us for second opinion. We used the culture-directed antibiotics, and then again, methylpre 
prednisolone, repeated the CAT scan, and this is what we saw again after our treatment was, was completed. Um, looking for my cursor again. There we go. And we can see the black in the sinus here that was gray on the other side. So totally clear. Again, symptoms improved, headaches went away, CT scan cleared, surgery avoided, and in fairly extensive disease also here uh, through extra diagnosis and extra medical treatment. So just a little summary of the evaluation part of things. Uh, detailed history, talking and listening to the patient's symptoms. Uh, physical exam, the endoscopy, and the CT scan. And then comprehensive medical therapy, endoscopic cultures, oral steroids if needed in these select cases. And uh, in summary, we're trying to use this comprehensive or aggressive medical therapy so that we could be conservative with surgery. So what if surgery is needed? Um, what are we talking about then? Um, there's three kinds of surgical interventions I'm going to introduce to you. The first is classic sinus surgery. And this uh, was surgery that was done from the early 1900s all the way up to uh, in mid-80s, early in 90s. Uh, this was exclusively what was done. So the technology at that point allowed for uh, doctors to make incisions over the sinuses. So an incision through the skin of the face to get at the ethmoid sinus, lifting up the gum to get at the maxillary sinus, an incision across the scalp to expose the frontal sinus of the forehead. Come on. That's interesting. How about if we do it like this? All right, where's the AV person? There we go. All right, I'll run it from here then. So we'll just we're just gonna hide behind the what do you do from here? So this is the skin with the flap coming down to get to here, okay, to, to operate on this sinus. So uh, everyone is cringing. <laughs> so there was an unmet need. There was a need for patients wanting to have less invasive surgery. So it's been kind of like a revolution uh, if in across the world in terms of minimally invasive surgery that's really happened by the endoscope. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is endoscopic sinus surgery. This technology with the endoscope actually came out of the aerospace industry, and we had these things called boroscopes that were used to look in jet engines uh, many years ago that were developed. Um, and this came to medicine, it was first used in urology uh, to look up the, in the urethra, and then some smart doctors in Austria began to look at this and first started looking in the nose and seeing things that were deeper than they could see with a little headlight. And then from starting to see the structures began to create a uh, method of surgery. To understand the surgery, I'm gonna give you a little background. So inside of the sinus, there's this special lining called respiratory epithelium. And it, if we look here as the skin of your face, this is the bone underneath it we're representing. Beneath that, we have a layer that has blood vessels and nerves. Beneath that is this respiratory epithelium. So these are the cells, and then these are the cilia. And Dr. Guadera has talked about this cilia that's there, and it's a, a quite an amazing structure. The mucus is made at this level, and then the... Um, Mucus is made here, that's the blue. And the mucus is in two layers. One is a gel phase and a sol phase. And it comes up through here and creates this, uh, the sol phase and then the gel phase here, which is the dark blue. And all of the cilia beat in the same direction so that they, they move sort of like slowly back one way. They grab a little bit of this gel and then they, they beat one way and then they go back slowly and they grab this and, and move it. So it's like a conveyor belt. 
So basically, you've got a layer of slime inside your sinuses and inside your nose. And the cilia amazingly beat this um, out of the sinus osteum into the nose. And as Dr. Guderich was showing you, it all goes out the, the osteum. So all of this mucus that's made all comes out through the natural osteum of the sinus, okay? No matter where it's made, it all comes out that natural opening. And that happens not just in the maxillary sinus here, it happens in every one of those little sinus cavities that happen. And it's all going down into the nose. And then in the nose, it's creating a slime blanket in the nose. If you put a piece of sugar in the front of the nose, you will have and have a patient just sit there and ask them to tell you when they taste it. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, they'll be able to tell you, I taste it. So it, it just moves it right back and then goes into the throat. And we make about a pint of mucus a day in our noses. And you swallow that all day long and mix it in with your saliva and don't even know it. So this is what cleans inside of our, this is the mechanism that, that cleans inside of our noses. So just like your eyes, you have the, the tear duct and it makes tears and you blink all day and it, you don't have to wash your eyeball. Inside your nose, you make this mucus and the cilia sweep this back and that's why you don't really have to like wash inside your nose when it's working well in health. Okay, so that's an important concept behind how they thought about making, doing the new surgery. So in a time of uh, disease, one of the things is that that pathway leading out of the sinus becomes obstructed. It could be an anatomic obstruction, it could be a cold that causes some swelling, and then it's blocked. And bacteria now get into the sinus, and it's dark, it's warm, there's mucus in there that has protein and sugar. So it's a great place for it to, to multiply. And so that's how you can get a bacterial sinus infection. That's what we're showing on this, on this slide here. So the uh, Austrian doctors got some really tiny, almost like jeweler, precise instruments and put the endoscope in and started to work on uh, this, the idea of surgery. So the idea is is these little precise instruments can come in and target exactly where the obstructions are and remove that small little piece of tissue. And once you relieve that obstruction, the cilia are there trying to beat the mucus and the bacteria and the, the infection that's in here out and trying to clean the sinus up. And over time, it clears all of the bad pathogens from the sinus and it restores it to health. So that's the background theory on how the endoscopic sinus surgery works. Additional considerations. This is simplistic from the standpoint that it's not the only reason people get sinusitis. So one is infection and block anatomic blockage, but inflammation is another very key source of uh, problems that we have. And Dr. Guderis has kind of showed you a lot about that. Sort of the end stage of, disease, of thickness or inflammation in the mucosa is a condition where we have these sinonasal polyps. I'll show you a brief video with a patient with sinonasal polyps. And the patient can no longer breathe through their nose due to the polyps. So that's their major complaint. So I'm putting the endoscope here in the right nostril. This is a tiny little instrument that um, is going to engage the polyp. There's the polyp right there. And this instrument sucks the polyp into it and cuts it. And you can see how it's just reducing the size of the polyp. This is surgery. I'm going to show you the whole surgery in real time. Right? And there it is blocking the throat by little pieces. It's real precise. We're not touching any of the other areas on the patient. We're only touching the polyp. So there's almost no trauma here. And you'll see now there's the back of the throat. So now they can breathe. Now the next step is to try like pulling a dandelion by the stalk or by the root. We're going to try to get the root here. We're going up on the stem. And we're going to try to find where the polyp is based. And if we can get really close to that, then it'll decrease the chance of it coming back. So, so all finished there. And um, we'll see in the back here, that's the back of the throat. So the patient now is airways restored and they can breathe again. 
All right, so that's it. That's an example of the endoscopic surgery, how it's more minimally invasive. And uh, the next step is there were some really smart people out in Silicon Valley that were looking for applications of the balloon technology that was used in the heart. So if you can imagine 20 years ago, 30 years ago, everyone had open heart surgery with coronary artery bypass grafts from their legs. And they saw how over time, putting small catheters through the coronary, coronary arteries and balloons and dilating the arteries decreased the amount of surgeries there. And you know, this uh, led to this innovation in terms of balloon catheter uh, treatment of the heart. And they were thinking of other places this could be used. And uh, one step led to another. And they uh, began to look at, was this feasible to use this in, in the nose and the sinuses? So well, I'm going to show you some of this new technology uh, with balloon catheter. And these pictures here show the concept. On the first slide here, there's a small catheter placed into the area. And a, a small wire is passed through the obstruction. The next, the balloon is passed over it. And then the balloon is inflated and removed. And the, the drainage pathway is now restored so that cilia can beat the mucus and infection out of the sinus. I'm going to show you a video clip of an animation of how this works. Okay. You'll first see the, the wire being guided in, and they're going to probe. They're going to, they probed off into the ethmoid. That didn't work. They'll probe again, and now they're in to pass the obstruction into the frontal sinus. The yellow is the infection. They pass the balloon, dilate the balloon, relieve the obstruction, remove the mucus. Over that catheter, we place another catheter, spray antibiotics solution in there, and rinse the sinus out, and try to restore the anatomy. So this is getting to another level of sophistication in terms of minimal invasive uh, type of surgery. All right, without a pointer, this is going to be a little hard, but we'll, we'll try, to, try to do this. This patient has had endoscopic surgery already. It worked very nicely for the ethmoid sinuses, but they're having some frontal headache problems. Um, oh, where is it? There it is. We're going to come over here, and we're looking with a different scope that has a different angle. And we're, so we can get to look under. There's this ledge here. We're going to put an endoscope in that looks at a 70 degree angle. And underneath there, we see the opening into the frontal sinus is really, really tiny not thick enough for mucus to come out, very, very obstructed. So we're going to come down here, place our guiding catheter, and place the little wire that goes in, uh, in through. I'm going to try to thread that past the obstruction. We get that into the frontal sinus, and then we place our balloon here. Here we have the balloon now inflated. We'll deflate the balloon here. We'll remove the balloon and place a suction catheter. We're suctioning all the mucus that was blocked in the sinus out. And then we can see the final view here of the opening that we achieved. And we're looking way up into the frontal sinus there. OK. okay. So those are the three basic kind of surgical interventions that, uh, it, that we can do in, uh, currently. Just to conclude, again, we like to analyze each patient's condition through a dedicated approach using the clinical history, the CT scan, and the endoscopy. We like to consider any additional testing, repeating medical therapy to avoid surgery, using surgery as a last resort, and individualizing the surgical approach for each patient. So you say, you have eight sinuses. Do you need one done? Do you need two? We need all eight, so we should really target it to exactly what you need and use the least amount of surgery to achieve the greatest benefits, employing minimally invasive modern uh, techniques. Additionally, close postoperative care is needed in the follow-up period, okay? and, and it's especially important in terms of using medical therapy, because as Juan said, sometimes you have both things going on. There's an anatomic problem and there's allergies. So we need to, to, to combine both of the specialties. 
Thank you very much. I'm just going to kind of summarize a little bit some of the questions that we have here and, and if you're looking for positions to um, take them as appropriate. Um, I think the first place to start with one of the questions that we've seen as well online and uh, here is just are there any particular tests or processes that uh, patients should go through before they come to the site? That's a difficult question to answer because uh, many times uh, a patient who comes to the center has required already some degree of medical therapy by the primary care provider. Many times the patient has tried over-the-counter medication and frequently a lot of over-the-counter medication. I, I think uh, the way I see it, the center, what it tries to do is give you an idea, a comprehensive idea of which localized area to see in, in, in a comprehensive fashion. So I don't know if this is something you have to do. If you've had evaluations elsewhere, bring your CT scan. If you've had allergy tests done elsewhere, bring your uh, allergy testing. If you've had a lot of laboratory studies before, bring them there. So maybe that's mainly the only thing that we recommend before coming and collecting them. Um, and I'm going to attempt to find our questions online, but um, I am, do have another question that I'd like that, that we've seen a few times as well. I think uh, either one of you, but Dr. Fulger is doing more for you. Um, is it feasible that time come could affect one hearing, ears, or talking about the jaw issues? How do you know if it's a science issue or if you need a different uh, a dentist or what do you know? Um, I, I think we should rephrase the question. <laughs> um, you, you know, the, there, are, in a strict sense, the, the answer to the question as you've asked it, are sinus disease doesn't cause ear disease. <coughs> So they're, they're really not related, okay? From a patient's standpoint, if you're having a, a pain in the face, that pain could be coming from many different things. And sometimes the pain that's happening over a sinus uh, is indicative of something going on inside the sinus like infection. Sometimes, though, we do a CAT scan and the sinus is negative and the patient's really convinced it's, it's coming from the sinus, and that's very reasonable because that's where they're feeling it. But the pain may be coming from somewhere else. And I like to use the model of what's called referred pain. And the classic example of that is that many times when men have heart attacks, they don't have chest pain. Sometimes they have pain in their arm, their left arm, or sometimes they have pain in their, their left lower jaw. There's nothing wrong with their teeth or their jaw. But if this part of the body's dying, and they're having the pain here, there's nothing wrong. So in a simple way, it's like signals getting crossed, that the pain is, is referred to a different area. So in the sinuses, sometimes we can have uh, the temporomandibular joint, which is your jaw joint, and that can get arthritis or inflammation like any other joint in the body. And sometimes people feel it in the, in the joint, but sometimes they feel it in their ear, or sometimes they feel it out in the face over the sinuses. That's one example of pain that could be referred. Problems in the joint, but they feel it in the sinus. Sometimes migraines um, can have not only facial pain, but even nasal congestion associated with it. So it's very confusing. From a patient's standpoint, it really feels 
like they have a sinus problem, and they are experiencing something in their sinuses. Many of those patients have nasal congestion, uh, and so it, it, it really feels that way, but it's actually part of a migraine syndrome uh, that's happening. So it's, it, there's a lot of nuance to this, and it's, you know, this can be very complicated from a diagnostic standpoint. So <coughs> underscoring what Dr. Guderis is saying, it's really important to get a good diagnosis in the beginning. Uh, sinus disease is also pretty common. So we can have somebody who has migraine pain and have something on the CAT scan, and what's on the CAT scan isn't causing the symptoms, and they could have surgery and not get rid of their pain. So we really want to be careful with taking these first steps to do the diagnosis right. Okay. Um, we've had a few questions online, and, and uh, I suspect people here as well may have some, some questions. And although um, certainly I want to, uh, to preference that, I'm going to mention some, some medication <coughs> here, but I'm not in Georgia. Um, but the questions have come up with respect to Adrifex, um, Loratadine. Um, is there a better drug versus another, um, one medication over the another when it comes to treating allergies or a little stuff? Yes, the, the use of antihistamine is um, somewhat controversial in treatment in the United States. In the case of what you mentioned with the mercury, the antihistamine can meet all of it. Histamine, the primary effect that produces it, it means usually burning. It doesn't work for congestion. Congestion is a secondary to the second condition. So when you try to find an antihistamine for those, you generally classify them in two categories. The antihistamine that you give for patients, and the antihistamine that you want to use for them. The old Benadryl, Rosanitol, and all the others. There's the non sedating antihistamines, the Allegra, the Claritin, the Loratadine, and so forth. Sirtex is a little bit in the middle. About 10% of patients on Sirtex do a little stuff. And so it's a little bit in the middle for this kind of therapy. Um, but potency wise, that's somewhat equivalent. <coughs> Loratadine is a little bit in the middle. Talked a little bit. Uh, the, the steroids in general are divided into systemic steroids and topical steroids. Systemic steroids are just the <coughs> amount and stress levels of tissue. And they have a lot of side effects and they have a lot of problems. You have to use them carefully. Uh, we use them all. We use them all. Topical steroids, and especially the new topical steroids, are. <coughs> Different kind of molecule that when you put it in the nose or you put it in the lungs, the amount of it, if it goes through the epithelium, they can metabolize. When you get to the blood, most of it goes to the lungs. So the clinical profile of tropical steroids is really a good quality thing. I always refer to the patients, everybody online nowadays, if you want to see how steroids and the fear of side effects. Look at asthma camp studies. When you perform your study in children, the camp has no steroids for their asthma. It's safe for them. It's true. You have to learn how to use them. Thank you. What about the use of steroids? What's in the use of nasal steroids? Most of the time, they're tolerated. Once or one is a problem when and one of the reasons you see more often is the patient who's put in the tray a little bit over the septum. And so the septum gets thin and maybe bleeds every so often. And that case means they have too much system surface. But if you use this tray correctly, you are away from the septum and they get turbulent, side effects. The side effect profile is safe and you can use it for a long time. I practiced pediatric allergy for many years. 
And that throne has King David's throne for God. Mm. I one for you, um, or a couple of things I want to you, but uh, again, I'm going to try to summarize, so I appreciate everyone <coughs> there next to us, but um, if you would be able to, to first start out by clarifying whether sinoplasty is the same as the pinch surgery, and then um, talk a little bit about the stent, what was said there. And then I'll I've, I've never heard of the stent surgery. Who asked that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, um, when you open these openings into the sinus, so we showed how, uh, if we have a, we showed with the balloon how we had a little opening and we opened it with the balloon. We showed with the cartoon that I had how we had the little forceps taking the piece out. Especially when you're cutting, if you go in and you cut and you open that sinus up, the body doesn't know a surgeon did that. The body knows, the program in the, po the body is, I've been wounded. Somebody just stabbed me. I got poked. And now I got a hole here. So the program in the body is to heal that. And so what can happen is the surgeon goes in, makes an opening in the sinus, drains out the infection, and then if you do nothing, sometimes, you know, because the, these holes are small, it may be one or two millimeters, and we make it five millimeters. And if you have that size hole anywhere in your body, your body's programmed to heal that up. So we make the hole, and two to three weeks later, the body's trying to close it off. So there are different strategies to keep that open. And one is that the patient comes back to see me once a week for four weeks. And when we see the healing start, if the healing starts to go across, we try to break that down because early on there's no pain fibers in it. And we want the healing to go around rather than across, okay? Some doctors have thought to put a stent in there and to prevent that. Now that sounds like a good idea. There are issues with that though because it's a foreign body, okay? So when you put the stent in, if you have bacteria, it can get on the stent. And it can actually incite scar tissue if there's infection and inflammation there. So, you know, it, it, it sounds like a good idea. It has to be done in some cases where something keeps rescarring over and over again. But um, in general, most people will try to do the surgery in a way where we uh, really spare mucosa and be very precise cutting and try not to use a stent. That is a difficult question also to answer because the mechanism of snoring is usually coming from soft pad. You imagine the mouse which has a hard power and the soft power behind. And then in the back which has a gap, pure wall. As you go over, if you go a little bit over, that space gets a little mess. It's causing issues. It's that then you got the sheer wall, that's the sheer soft pattern, and that's the most effect. People who have nasal disease occasionally are primarily mouth breathing. And people who breathe that out with the mouth, they have a little more problem. So sometimes, if you can fix a little bit of nasal, it is possible that it's possible. But people are too much undulated, especially in the mouth. And sometimes you just have to be people that just don't want to fix it. 
Yes. <laughs> we Let's see, there's two different things there. So the, uh, the airplane is quite uh, easy, the physics of this. So when you go up in the airplane, the, the uh, air that's in your sinus is at barometric pressure for at ground level. When the plane goes up, uh, the atmospheric pressure decreases and that air expands. It has to go somewhere. So it will work its way, if there's a little obstruction, it will work its way out. Some people actually hear some little squeaking sounds and it pushes itself out if you've had a cold a few weeks before. The problem comes when you go to descend, then the reverse happens. The air that's left in the sinus at altitude, as you descend, that gets kind of compressed and pulls itself in and it's going to create a vacuum in the sinus. It will try to get air from the airplane and the nose to equilibrate, but if you have swelling in there, it can't get past, it's like a valve. And then you have all that negative pressure, and it typically happens on descent, when you're descending in the airplane, and patients uh, can have anything from a, a mild headache a few hours after descending to actually the feeling like an ice pick going right through your face. Uh, they can be extremely painful on the way down. Most of the time with commercial air flight, the cabins are pressurized between five and 8,000 feet, and the descent is very, very gradual. So most of the time, patients don't have a lot of problems. They actually have more ear problems than sinus problems. If, uh, by using some decongestants, uh, especially Afrin nasal spray, uh, before you descend, uh, a couple sprays in on each side, that can help in some patients. Uh, it is different if you are a military tactical aviator and if you're in an unpressurized cabin, it is, it is quite different because they can have some extremely uh, in, uh, bad pressures uh, and it's also a problem for Navy divers sometimes too. Um, the other issue uh, in terms of 
when you're having barometric pressure changes and people, I have many patients who will tell me, don't have that picnic on Sunday, it's going to rain. And like they can feel a front coming in. That, that I don't think has anything to do with your sinuses at all. I, and I can't explain it. I, I can't explain it, but there are patients that are extremely accurate in being able to predict that and they really feel that in their head they are feeling something that correlates with that barometric pressure when a storm is coming in. But I've seen it happen in patients that have very sick sinuses, and I've seen it happen in patients that have normal sinuses. So I, I can't really uh, say that that's been studied, and we know exactly what that is as doctors. Yeah. Okay, is that the next question? The first thing that I'm going to deal in a little bit that issue for recent content, but I was dedicating it a little bit more to add something a little bit more than previous to. What we see is very interestingly, the people from Latin America, the response to COVID were. There is a little more parasiticism. They tend to have less allergic. But as they move to the US, it changed to their body. And they have less parasitic disease. The allergic disease changes. There's no specific um, <coughs> difference in terms of different allergies. It's just that they tend to develop more allergies when they move to this environment. And it usually takes several several years to develop that for some and study another generation. We don't see a lot of that in the anatomy of the parent, but we see a lot of it in the children. This takes you to a really fascinating phenomenon. And is what is the role of IgE? And IgE that has shown you there was an antibody that actually developed through the years to the document because it was the antibody that will help us to fight COVID. But when we are in an environment like this, like this organism is like that for the issue, the immune system just said, we directing the target instead of directing to parasites that are in the disease. It's just getting to the right thing. And it's just a misdirection of that immune system. And finally, section of the Secondarily, possibly. Okay. So, if, if a true sinus infection, you'll have some increased mucus. You may have more throat pain. <coughs> you could, if your sinuses are filled with purulence, you're not going to have the resonance that you would have in the sinus in the head. So, when you speak, because the sinuses are air chambers, it creates resonance in the voice. And if you fill the sinuses up with liquid, that resonance goes away. So if you, had, if you had a drum or you had a violin and you filled the air chamber uh, with liquid, it wouldn't, wouldn't resonate anymore. So this is why people will, will have, uh, their voice will sound stuffy, uh, their voice will sound different. Now, if by, mean, by sinus infection you mean a cold, um, a viral upper respiratory tract infection, that can affect the voice. And sometimes that first starts in the nose and it feels like a sinus infection, but it's just really a nasal viral illness that then progresses and goes into the throat uh, and then deeper down into the voice box. And so sure, that's going to affect the quality of the voice quite significantly. And that's where people can lose their voice temporarily. Okay. Yeah. As a tie-in to that, to um, the illness and the different infections. Um, it's a two-part question, I think. Um, how common is it for allergy symptoms to actually evolve back into something more, like a sinus infection? And <coughs> two would be, are certain people who might be prone to sinus infections, um, do we know whether they have Perhaps less of good bacteria versus another type of bacteria in their system that would 
cause that to happen? Are there things that they can say to alleviate that? So, so part one is? Um, how common is it for the common cold symptom to eventually to evolve into a sinus infection? It occurs in 05 to 2%. So 99% of the time it doesn't get into a bacterial infection. And the other part had to do with bacterial. Are any individuals um, who might be prone to uh, sinus infections, do you see that they have more or less of uh, any particular good or bad bacteria? Yes, in the that's clearly, uh, it's not in their system. It's, we, we, we can recover the bacteria in the sinuses uh, with endoscopy, especially after surgery. Um, it's very, it's much easier then, but either way, we can recover that. And based on that, and Dr. Guadera showed a slide of this, that patients with acute sinusitis had certain bacteria. In chronic sinusitis, they had certain bacteria. And uh, even after multiple surgeries, they developed into even different bacteria. So uh, it's, it, 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 defi it definitely changes, yes. I wonder, I wonder if the question is like, mm. and it's kind of just a little bit, I think it refers also a, one concept that is very, very new, and especially in the sciences, it's very, very new. It's the concept of the biota. And we've heard of this balance and between good and bad bacteria. And uh, do we know that this dysregulation between good and bad bacteria is producing, in particular, GI disease? And there's some preliminary data that is starting to suggest that maybe the balance good and bad bacteria may happen in the sinuses. And in a way, we, we think that uh, it's starting to meet this actually. Is there an article recently in Science in which the investigators explained is that the treatments that we give in, to some degree change that aspect as well. So what we want to try to do as practitioners, both is really understand, let the body heal. Because when the body heals, then there's a good balance, hopefully, will come back. And, uh, but that is very, very new. We need a lot more support. Well, I know we have some other questions. I haven't gotten to, but in the interest of time, um, I, I want to first thank our physicians for spending the evening with us. Um, again, thank you all to everyone here and on the Eagle Hangout for, for joining us. Um, the physicians will stay around for just a, a little bit longer to answer some of the other questions. Um, I will continue to post as well as my colleagues um, online. Um, and I think I'd like to wrap it up by just asking one of you if you'd like to just summarize um, how someone might make an appointment and, and pay for those folks that, that we see here. In general, we see both this time as a circumstance of the surgery means of once we can see patients that are there. Particularly the time we have in the pharmacy here, that is in the pharmacy, and even the one that is in the surgery center, because the pharmacy is the same. So we're doing it.